You know, surviving the launch of a startup is a lot like surviving a zombie apocalypse. There are rules to every game, and for entrepreneurs, a lot of them are the same rules that apply in The Walking Dead. Hi, my name's Huge, and I'm a business mentor and an angel investor, and I like to use The Walking Dead as an analogy on how to survive as an entrepreneur. So in this video, I'd like to share 10 business lessons that you can learn by watching The Walking Dead, so stay tuned. I didn't come up with this idea and I actually borrowed it from one of my mentors who invited me to his home in Rancho Santa Fe for a party. When I arrived I realized he had uh, transformed his palatial estate into the post-apocalyptic world of The Walking Dead. So I thought that was weird because he didn't watch TV so I went to Nakoda and I said Nakoda you hate TV and do you watch The Walking Dead? And he said I absolutely hate TV I think it's an idiot box but I love The Walking Dead. And I said, why? And he said, because The Walking Dead is the best show on television to learn business principles from. And I couldn't believe that. He said that you can learn more by watching The Walking Dead than you can by watching Shark Tank. So being a good mentee, I went home and spent the next two sleepless weeks uh, almost becoming a zombie, Netflixing the rest and catching up to season four. And I've been a fan ever since, and I could not agree more that he's absolutely right. Now, uh, this week, business magazines have been freaking out about the last episode of The Walking Dead. Of course, I'm talking about season six, episode three entitled Thank You, which I think a lot of fans would agree with me. They should have entitled it Thank You AMC for reaching into my chest and pulling out my still beating heart because it was so painful to watch. I hope I'm not spoiling this. I'm filming this five days after watching it because, uh, you know, I didn't want to be emotional during this film. Uh, I'm probably going to fail at that. But uh, it shouldn't be a spoiler that uh, Glenn appears to have died in the last episode. So all the different magazines have their own theory as to how or why he died. The first was Forbes. Forbes came out with a theory that he actually slipped underneath the uh, dumpster. He's totally fine. He's in the arms of Maggie because that the guts you saw were actually Nick's. That's possible, but I just the idea that he didn't get bit is far-fetched. Now, the Wall Street Journal came out, and they said, no, absolutely is zombie food. So he's, he's dead. You'll see him in the next episode as a walker. And then the Huffington Post came out with a really strange idea. They said that there is a phantom click that could not have come from Glenn's gun, so it had to have been Nick's. Therefore, when Nick pulls the gun to his head and shoots himself, thereby killing Glenn, it's all a hallucination because out of bullets. There's no way he could have shot himself. So... Honestly, I think someone at the Huffington Post has been huffing on something. <laughs> but uh, regardless of which theory you believe, obviously a lot of entrepreneurs watch The Walking Dead. And so it makes it a great tool for mentoring. So here are my 10 business lessons that you can learn from The Walking Dead. I'm going to share them one by one. And just for fun, I'm going to introduce each one with a different style rendition, musical rendition of the famous theme song <laughs> that I found online. So enjoy. Here we go. Lesson 10. Most people are walkers. They go through life brain dead. You know, in the world of The Walking Dead, 5% are survivors and 95% are walkers. And the series starts in Atlanta where you see abandoned cars mile after mile stuck bumper to bumper fleeing the city. Now, this would seem completely normal if it weren't for the fact that there are no cars on the other side of the road. Because in this world... <laughs> 5% of people are business owners, and 95% of people are employees. Every morning rush hour, you have a herd of barely awake people filing into cubicles, filing to the lines at lunch, filing in lines back to work, and then filing back into that herd on the way home. 
Maybe they go home and they get on social media mindlessly, go through, watch the reality TV, and then they go to sleep repeating the same cycle again and again. You know, when you decide to start your own business, it's a lot like being awake in a world of zombies. You know, uh, it's just a monumental shift. I used to be part of that 95%. Uh, I had a six-figure job, but I also had six-figure bills. So that kept me working in the job that I kind of liked, but kind of didn't. You know, uh, what caused me to wake up one day is an unexpected divorce. That divorce caused me to lose half my time with my two Asian babies, which are the most precious things in the world to me. And uh, suddenly, I wasn't happy with that cushy job anymore, that corner office. I just wanted my freedom back. You know, most entrepreneurs have the some reason why they woke up out of that herd. And why, that's why I love working with them. Most entrepreneurs would rather gladly spend 100 hours a week working to build their own dream than 40 hours a week building someone else's. And that really makes being an entrepreneur more about following your passion and instead of being a brain dead part of the herd. Lesson number nine. If you get too close to a walker, you will get bit. You know, when you start your own business, you'll find that everyone's got an opinion. Even people who have no business being in business have an opinion about yours. And they'll always preface the most negative things in the world to say by saying, hey bro, I'm not trying to be negative, I'm just being real. Yeah, you're being real real negative. You know, my, one of my mentors says, being realistic is the most commonly traveled pathway to mediocrity. And I couldn't agree more. Like a zombie virus, negativity is contagious. And everyone has it deep inside them. Everyone at some point or another is negative. One of the saddest things on the show is when you see a character that can't let go of someone who used to love them, support them, be there for them, but now they've become bitten by the virus. When we see Herschel keeping his wife in that barn locked up, or the governor keeping his daughter like a little bride of Chucky <laughs> stuck in his closet, you know, you have to get to a point where you have to let go of them, otherwise the virus will affect you. You'll find that people who supported you your whole life in a dead-end job that you could barely tolerate, but they won't support you when it comes to you trying to own your own business, win back your own freedom. You know, a lot of people who you love and who love you will love you to broke. And that's because they can't get out of that herd mentality. They can't think of anything else other than having their whole lives controlled by a paycheck. If someone you love doesn't support you, don't be surprised. You know, if they try to dissuade you from your dream, don't be discouraged. I had a mentor who sat, thought for sure the person who loved him most in the world was his mom. So when he started his business, who did he go to as his first customer? Of course, his mom. And he, he was surprised and heartbroken to find his mom saying, I wouldn't be your customer if it were free. It crushed him, but he went on, he let it, didn't let him discourage him, and he became a multiple six-figure earner instead of being a, an engineer for Bank of America stuck in his job uh, working 100 hours a week. And so uh, now his mom is, is happily his supporter. So in this world, uh, people that you cut off because they're negative about your business sometimes will come back when you have success. You've got to give them that chance. You can't give them that chance by uh, allowing them to stain your lives though. So for the time being, when they don't support you, you've got to let them go. Lesson number eight, there's safety in numbers. No one survives long term on their own. You know, one of my favorite business mentors from afar is Christina Comerford. She is a high school dropout that became one of the most successful entrepreneurs in America today, taking three companies public uh, before the age of 40, and now she's an angel investor. She's had some of the best mentors in the world, including Richard Branson and Steve Jobs. And sh when she mentors people, sh one thing she finds common with entrepreneurs is that they're surprised by the loneliness. They're not ready for it. The overwhelming loneliness, feeling like you're the only one on earth that cares about your business, the late nights, the early mornings, the endless emails, and that people need to understand when they're like that, that you don't need to be alone. You know, the law of association says you will become like the five people you can hang out with the most. If you hang out with five negative people, guess what? You're going to be the sixth negative person. If you hang out with five successful people, you'll be the sixth successful person. You've got to surround yourself with survivors, just like The Walking Dead. You know, people who have been 
at it and in it longer than you have, they actually not only increase your chance for survival, but they also increase your chance for succeeding. Lesson number seven, if you lose your head, you will wind up dead. One of my favorite episodes from season five was the revolving door episode where you had Nick from Alexandria, Glenn, and some random dude. You know, every time there's a random dude, it's like a red shirt, random red shirt guy on Star Trek. <laughs> He's going to die at some point or another. You know, and they were scouting out a mall and then they got trapped in one of those doors with uh, Glenn and random dude on one side and Nick on the other. And Glenn is talking to Nick telling him not to panic because he's been there before. But Nick has not been in that situation, and so he pushes himself through the revolving door, which opens up Glenn's side, and the random guy unfortunately gets eaten. And then Glenn is stuck in what is literally a glass case of emotion. <laughs> uh, everyone at some point or another feels like that, and everyone goes through the same uh, panic. You know, a lot of my mentees are female. And I'm not surprised by that. A lot of my mentors are female because the landscape of entrepreneurialism has changed. Pre-recession used to be that most of the business world was dominated by men. You're finding now more and more women taking action, women kicking butt, not only looking beautiful, but being boss babes, boss ladies. And a lot of them are my mentors. They give me the same exact advice that they give to their mentees, which is keep your emotions in check. Realize this. Everyone has a time where they feel like they're in a glass case of emotion. The only way to get out of that situation is to keep your cool, keep your head, and never let them see you sweat. By doing that, a lot of times you buy yourself time to actually make positive action. And that, that worry, that stress, actually provides energy to find a solution. Lesson number six, selfish people die alone. You know, in the pre-apocalyptic world of The Walking Dead, it was okay to live an insular life. You know, your business was your business. What you did with your money, who you dated, what you did with your time. You were responsible for yourself. And if something bad happened to your neighbor, even the guy down the street, it was none of your concern. It didn't affect you. Now, post-epidemic, every person counts. Everything you do, everything they do counts. It counts to you. And their survival, their very survival, increases your probability of survival as well. In pre-recession business landscape, the landscape of business, greed was good. You know, golden parachutes and profit at all costs was the norm. But after the bailouts of the banks and then the bailouts of the auto industry, things really changed in America. You know, the recession showed that the operating principles of business as usual was really just a cesspool of greed and criminal intent. And over the last three years, especially, there's been a new kind of business arising. It's called a benefits corp or a B corp. Now, com these are companies that have ingrained into the entity of their formation philanthropy and common good. You know, now you have companies where philanthropy and common good are not only essential to survive, but actually they thrive because of it. More and more in this landscape, you're, you're, you're going to see in business that the companies that put the common good or philanthropy first are the ones that will not just do well, they're, they're going to kick ass. Lesson number five, everyone's got a job to do and every skill serves a purpose. You know, in The Walking Dead, a lot of times you see characters thrown together and seemingly haphazardly. It seems that there's some people that have a high purpose, like Glenn, Daryl, and Rick, the bros of the apocalypse. You've got other people that are just not that important to the story. And one of those people to me seemed like Carol. Carol, I just thought, what is her point for being on the show? <laughs> I didn't see it for the first three, four seasons. In fact, it wasn't until season five that I really started to love Carol. Carol was completely different from uh, Rick, Glenn, and Daryl in the fact that she blended in. They, she wasn't an obvious leader. She seemed like she didn't serve a great purpose. It wasn't until the, the, the group came to a, a town called Terminus. Her ability to blend into the crowd and be considered not a threat is exactly why everyone's still alive today in the, in the current cast. So what happened was she took 
zombie guts and she put them all over her body and her her clothes and she blended in with the other walkers and so she she was able to go in and kick everyone's butt and save the day this season and the end of last season she did the same thing in alexandria but she became betty homemaker because she was in the suburbs and so she blended in and became a non-threat but actually she was always like a hawk watching everything and she's the one that saves alexandria again she dresses up as the wolf and blends in as one of them. It's precisely her difference from Rick, Glenn, and Daryl that made her so important. Everyone's got a job to do. Now, when it comes to being a CEO, you don't want to hire people just like you. You want to hire people that are different than you. A CEO's job is to hire to your weaknesses and to maintain the vision of the company so that you're working on the business, not in the business. Hire people that have your weaknesses, that can do the things that you can't do, that would take up too much of your time. And that way, you're going to have a stronger community, a stronger business. Lesson number four, search all vulnerabilities because what you don't know can kill you. You know, the first thing you got to do when you, uh, if you're going to make a base out of any new surrounding or situation, you've got to check for all the vulnerabilities. You've got to check the windows, the door locks, that seemingly uh, mundane uh, supply closet in the black back with a scratch, scratch. You know, it's probably the thing that's going to kill you if you don't check it. So whenever you get in a new situation, you've got to find out your weaknesses. You know, optimism is vital for being an entrepreneur, but blind optimism is different and that can actually kill you. I am a business mentor and also an angel investor and I run an angel fund. So I give money to startups and, and companies that need funding. And uh, I get approached by people all the time who really believe they're the biggest cheerleader for their company and as well you should be but they also have a kind of blind optimism to me it's kind of like in the walking dead when you get the group they were on their way to dc and they think oh, all we need to do is get to dc and everything will be happy sunshine and of course it's not and then later on they thought all we need to do is get to sanctuary get to terminus and everything will be happy sunshine and lo and behold surprise surprise it was not you know you gotta search out your vulnerabilities and when someone doesn't have a business plan they haven't searched their vulnerabilities Everyone who even comes with a business plan, I won't accept it unless it comes through a standard program like Business Plan Pro for the PC or Live Plan for the Mac. These are programs that only cost 30 bucks, and even if someone already has a business plan, I tell them go through that. Why? Because it forces you to ask the hard questions you don't even think of yourself. It asks you normal questions that are every business should ask and so when it comes to uh, giving money I don't I don't even consider it due diligence if you haven't asked yourself the right questions I will not give you an investor if you haven't done that if you're not looking for your blind spots who will so absolutely search all your vulnerabilities what you don't know can kill you but by doing so you can maintain your optimism just not don't have blind optimism Lesson number three, real world skill trumps all. I love season five when they come across a town called Alexandria and it's this green town. They even have solar and everything's perfect there. And that town has never suffered a zombie infestation ever in history since the beginning. They don't know what it's like to lose a single person. And so they think they're above it all. Now, Bill Gates has an amazing quote that I follow. He says, success is a lousy teacher. It seduces smart people into thinking that they cannot lose. You know, today, great entrepreneurs more and more often seem to be people who drop out of college, you know, and, and, and they go off and build great companies. Bad entrepreneurs more and more are the people that get more degrees and teach. Trevor Kalanick founded Uber, but before that, he dropped out of UCLA. Elizabeth Holmes is the youngest female billionaire on that list. She dropped out of Stanford to form Theranos. Brian Chesky actually dropped out of art school and now is the billionaire founder of Airbnb. Oftentimes, a paper degree is not worth more than the paper it's printed on. I don't give that much value anymore to a degree. I've got two degrees. I've got my master's. I don't use either of them. <laughs> And so give me someone who's got hunger, is humble and hardworking, and I will take them over any MBA for success. Lesson number two, and this is one of the most important, 
failure is the best teacher. Fail faster, fail forward, and fail wisely. You know, it doesn't matter who you are or how long you've been in the game or how successful you are. Losing people hurts. Last week, I had one of my boss lady mentors, one of my favorite people on the earth. Uh, she was heartbroken because some dear friends of hers, uh, friends in business and her real life friends, actually uh, went off to a different company, a competing company, and she felt really hurt by that. She's in the top 5.05% of money earners. She's in what's called the circle of champions. That, that shows to me that when I get hurt, uh, in business, something that I should expect. You know, in The Walking Dead, the strategy is to hope for the best, but always plan for the worst. You'll find that the people who have lost the most out of that cast are often the wisest, and it makes them better leaders. Not only that, it makes them more sympathetic characters. You know, you have to expect to lose some of the time. You can't expect to win all the time. So Bill Gates' quote is dead on. Uh, great companies fail too. Elon Musk is, is famous for recently saying that Tesla was founded on two completely faulty ideas. You know, Instagram started off as a bad copy of Foursquare. Today you'd never know it. You look at their success and all you see is billion dollar companies that are brilliant. But what separated these two companies from their competition is their ability to not only fail faster, but fail forward and fail wisely. There's something as a calculated failure where even when you fail, you're not out of business. Make sure that you plan for failure. It's part of your equation, and that's what a business plan will also help you do. And the number one lesson you can learn from The Walking Dead is significance comes from survival. Everyone starts off as a newbie. No one knows what they're doing in the beginning. You know, every new character that they introduce often wonders, am I going to be an actual character of the show or am I going to be a random that dies in the next episode? You know, how do you become a character of significance? And it's the same thing that's true in business that it's true in The Walking Dead is don't die. <laughs> Keep showing up. It's the people who give up too, a little too early, three feet short of gold, are the ones that are never remembered. It's the people that keep persevering, keep at it until they actually are successful that win. One of the great examples of this is Morgan. Morgan, it took him six seasons to become an actual character. In one of the episodes, he was completely crazy. Somehow he came back from being crazy, and now he's like a ninja on the show, and that's awesome. But my favorite character from the show, obviously, and this is what spurned my uh, making of this instead of posting what the video was supposed to, create your own Shark Tank, is Glenn. Glenn is famous for saying, I, I'm supposed to be delivering pizzas. And that's really what he would have been doing. But then obviously, uh, post-apocalypse, life had other plans for him. And even in the beginning, he was not one of my favorite characters. I really identified to Rick because Rick's a leader. I didn't identify with uh, you know, the Korean American, one of the only Korean Americans on TV, because he was kind of wimpy. You know, he was sneaky, he was smart, but he was dressed as a bad stereotype. The character himself almost turned down the part because he dressed like short round. He didn't say anything, first major appearance on TV, so he kept his mouth quiet. And then the creators of the show actually looked, looked at the his clothes afterward, and they're like, you know what, uh, we need to change your wardrobe. You look a lot like Short Round from Indiana Jones. And he's like, that's what I was trying to say. But he, of course, never said it because he didn't want to lose the part. You see Glenn not really standing out in the beginning. It's not till season two that he stands up. Someone recognizes the leadership in him, and that was Maggie. Uh, Maggie, said, uh, this is shortly after they go on a run where uh, <laughs> he famously picks up uh, condoms and uh, gets laid but um, Maggie s points out something she says you know you're smart you're brave and you're a leader and the other people don't want you to know that sometimes having someone believe in you is what it takes for you to survive to the point where you have significance for you to keep going and now you see that really he has become and grown into a part of that uh, Atlanta Trinity or the Bros of the Apocalypse. He's one of the three leaders, Glenn, Daryl, and Rick. And uh, and that happened because he took more risks than anyone else uh, in, the, in the group. He's the one, only character that has never killed a human being. And he's also the only character that always goes back. And even if someone shoots him, like Nick does, uh, he 
he still forgives them. And so I love that character. Uh, literally, he re represents the humanity in us all. I really hope they don't kill him uh, because he shows me it's possible to be in a crazy world and still remain uh, human, to treat people with dignity. And I really believe that that's uh, possible. And that's a hope. My, one of my hopes as a business mentor. So that's all I have. Uh, now it's time to hear from you. You know, uh, I would like to hear which theory do you believe? You know, the different business publications. Forbes says he slid under the dumpster and the guts are not his. Uh, the Wall Street Journal says, no, he's zombie fodder. And then uh, the Huffington Post says that it's all hallucination. And uh, so if you believe that last one, uh, try not to smoke too much, uh, at least not until it's recreationally legal. Um, and uh, that's it. So leave your comment below. I'd love to hear which one you believe. Um, also, which musical rendition did you like the most? Uh, I put these in the order that I liked. Uh, I like the country one the least. I like the Michael Jackson one the best. Uh, and I also like the heavy metal one. But uh, uh, maybe yours is different. So I, I put a link for that guy's video uh, in the next page. So give that guy some love. He deserves some credit. That was awesome. It's pretty funny as well. Also, did you like what you see? If you do, I'd be so honored if you would share this video with your friends or share it with a mentor or a mentee. Uh, also, subscribe if you want to see further episodes. Next week, I'm going to have uh, episode three of what I call uh, Create Your Own Shark Tank. And so, I, and I promise in my episode three, no harm will come to the handsome uh, Korean American in that episode. <laughs> okay, so that's all I have. So I'll see you guys next time. Take care. It's the end of the video, but I'd like to sh talk to the creators of uh, The Walking Dead and give you my five reasons why Glenn can't die. Okay, number five. That's not how he dies in the comic book. Now, I don't watch the comic book, I just don't want him to die. So, uh, number four, you can't break up the bros of the apocalypse. Come on, who's gonna fill that, that third spot? You're gonna put in Handlebar's mustache guy or uh, Father McCrazy? You know, you can't do it. Keep the bros of the apocalypse together. Number three is every good franchise has a token Asian. Indiana Jones, your Star Wars, your Star Trek. Don't kill off the Asian. Glenn is not wearing a red shirt. He's wearing a gold shirt like freaking Captain Rick. So you got to keep him alive. Don't kill your token Asian. Number two, there is a shortage of handsome, smart, Korean Americans on TV. You know, we're still reeling or trying to recover from Long Duck Dong from 16 Candles, and he wasn't even Korean. Uh, but nonetheless, there's only four uh, Korean Americans on TV today. The guy from Lost, I don't even remember his name, but the, the Korean guy from Lost. Uh, you got Sulu, who used to be Harold and Kumar, he's Korean. Uh, I like him better as Sulu than Harold, obviously. And then uh, there's Han from The Fast and the Furious. And then you got Glenn. Now, if you kill off Glenn, you're killing off 25% of Korean American males on TV. You can't do that. Don't do it. Okay. Don't do it. Okay. And the last number, uh, number one, is uh, Maggie will go crazy. And uh, there are TV does not need another crazy uh, Caucasian girl, white woman on TV. That's what reality TV is for. So don't kill Glenn. Keep Maggie happy. If you have to kill him, and you're looking for a handsome Korean American male that I don't know, maybe he's really business savvy to take his place, then uh, uh, I'll leave my number down below. Who's the Asian in Star Wars? Who do you think was the Asian in Star Wars? Yoda. Of course, yeah, of course it was Yoda. No, look at the facts. He, uh, he's short, his uh, food smells funny, uh, he can't speak English, and uh, he knows Kung Fu. There you go.